So um, we are Rodolfo Hernandez. I'm a postdoctoral researcher, postdoc researcher, uh, and I work with Jen. Uh, thank you for coming, Jen. Uh, and I, I don't know if we can move on. Yeah. Um, and I, I work with social communications of, of science. I have some, I have a dream of becoming the president of some university <laughs> in five, 10 years. And this is Marcela. Yo soy Marcela, estoy aprendiendo inglés y quiero ser la jefe de... Entonces, ¿por qué estás hablando español? Porque... Si quieres aprender inglés. No. <laughs> and we had this uh, project since 2018 called Clackers, Colectivo Clackers. Uh, and we used to call it in Spanish ciencia and in English it's sort of like engaging um, science in a different way. We uh, try to you know build on techno sciences widely speaking, uh, also on communication uh, issues and try to imagine novel spaces for that. Uh, we have done workshops in Colombia and elsewhere uh, since that year. And we try to explore corporal, corporeal, emotional, and discursive dimensions of, of social communication, of, of science. And we bring together uh, artists and scientific practitioners of all kinds, students, even administrative people working in universities, uh, professors, etc., to do or co-create whatever they want to do. And after that, we take the risk of presenting it to a wider audience in venues and night shows, et cetera. So here we are interacting with scientists and, and actors. Um, this, this was in, back in Medellin in 2019, and we loved that experience because the connection with the public was amazing. And, and this is a professor, two students working on biology, and one journalist from Nature working in Colombia. An amazing story. So you see the types of people that interact with us. And the purpose of today's workshop is it's easy, it's very introductory. And we want to talk about D, I for diversity, I for interculturality, and M for multilingualism. Multi How to say in Spanish that even? Multilingualism. Uh, and all in the context of the university. So feel fine of bringing old stories or the ones you're living now, students, researchers, and partners, etc. And at the end, we would like to think about or reflect on these, how to engage on DIM in the context of the university. There is an alert. You know, we can cry in Spanish and cry in English, right? And it's very different. Uh, and, it's going to be very bilingual. I'm happy that you're all sensitive to that. And we're going to try our best, right, Marcela? Sí. To make it... Este es el momento de salir de la sala. Si tienen miedo, si les asusta el bilingüismo, <laughs> es el momento de salir. Pero si se quedan, tienen la oportunidad. Si de pronto algo de español no, con Rodolfo. Y si de pronto algo de inglés no, conmigo. Pero veo que manejamos la mayoría de ambas lenguas. Entonces, si algo es el momento, después de que se cierra la puerta, nadie puede salir. <laughs> so we started talking about, thinking about this, not only from the context we have now, very bilingual, but also because uh, in our lives, and you know, you all know that uh, searching for words uh, in English and Spanish is part of our job all the time for us. So uh, it happened that uh, years ago, Marcel and I were looking for uh, common words in English and, and Spanish, and we found out nothing to be a surprise about these kind of things, uh, myself. Okay, vamos a empezar mirando, por ejemplo, sciences. In images, in images. Okay, in images. Okay, what do we see? Laboratories, scientists locos. Esto creería que es un actor. No sé si alguien se había sido en un laboratorio. <risa> eh, ¿Qué más vemos? A ver que estoy aquí con el, el mouse un poquito. 
Ok, generalmente ciencias exactas, ¿no? Ok, ahora en español, ¿cómo se traduce scientist? Científico. Científico, vale. Vamos a mirar científico. Ah, no, aquí no tenemos la tilde. Una W. Ok, vamos a ver, ¿qué podemos ver? Ahí, por ejemplo. Más mujeres. Uh -huh. Más mujeres. Menos locos. Menos locos. Ciencias exactas. Le Lego. Lego. <risa> Batas blancas. Ok. Pero resulta que en español, para hablar de mujeres, ¿cómo decimos científico? Científica. Ok. Científica. Ahora vemos las mujeres, un poco más, ¿no? Entonces, una primera como diferencia. En inglés no hay género para científico o científica. Es una sola palabra. En español es científico o científica. Hay versión de género, ¿no? Ok, vamos a mirar ahora researcher, por ejemplo. Okay. Vamos viendo. Esto, esto es como muy desde la cultura, comillas, popular. Lo que nos sale en Google nos puede salir a cualquier persona. Entonces, como de alguna forma un imaginario, por decirlo así. Aquí vemos algunas actividades. Hay de pronto un poco más de gráficos, etc. Ahora, ¿cómo se diría en español esta palabra? Investigador o investigadora. Vale, entonces empecemos con investigador. Vamos a ver qué pasa en español. Tenemos un detective. <risa> Tenemos... Vuelve y se repite, ¿no? Detective. <risa> detective. ¿Sí? Y si miramos de mujeres... Investigadora. Mm. Bueno, hay una versión sí, sí. femenina de detective. Pero hay, hay más ligado con ciencia. Hay más ¿no? ligado con ciencia, exactamente. Ok, ahora vamos a mirar intercultural. Ok, vemos como diferencias, eh, países, personas interaccionando, hablando. Colores, formas, etc. ¿Cómo se dice inter, intercultural en español? Igual. Igual, igual ¿no? Si yo vol, volviera a escribir, me vuelve y me sale lo mismo, ¿cierto? Ahora, ¿qué podemos encontrar ahí de diferencias en estos resultados? Yo, por ejemplo, me atrevo a decir que solo veo resultados en inglés. Por aquí hay una, una, por aquí, como que alza la mano, aquí hay otra, pero la gran mayoría están en inglés, ¿no? Digamos que en principio hacer esa reflexión es importante, una reflexión del lenguaje, ¿cierto? Como en, en un, una palabra tiene diferentes significados y formas en diferentes lenguas. Esa es como una actividad, digamos, introductoria para que conectemos un poco con lo que vamos a ver el día de hoy. And because we've seen this always in our work, it's so difficult for us to make sense of just with researchers, the best example. Whatever it comes to mind, it's very common. Like in Spanish, if you belong to a university, you might think immediately on a scientific researcher. But whenever you belong to other uh, sectors of the society, they might think about detective, like a detective. So thinking about those kind of uh, different differences, we'd like to invite you to share a little bit. Uh, I think we only have two pairs, so that's amazing. Um, uh, only these two questions. We, we want to know a little bit better what, what we do. I know you, you all know before, right? Yes. yes. But you didn't meet with them before. So try just to mix up and, and 
you know, know new people. So maybe I don't know if Ken or Javier wants with Jen and maybe Timoteo with Ken. I don't know if that's I don't know. Ken más que ellos. Entonces, yeah. okay, so yeah. Javier. And... Javier con Jen y okay. Javier con... And let's share for a couple of minutes this. And once when we're done, we can we can socialize what, whatever we think about these two questions. We are fine to explore from whatever anecdotes, stories, and you know, uh, happen here in, in your own work. And we'll be right back. Well, for the first one, I mean, uh, yeah, Research on Spanish language television and television. Yeah. 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 Most ways that I work, I mean, outside of like sort of the cultural diversity within faculty members or student base, there's not a whole lot within my research because I work with institutions that are largely like yeah, I mean, the National Weather Service or Emergency Management Community. So interestingly, the cultural diversity comes when there are participants who are members of the public and they're often very displaced from the population. So that's sort of the cultural diversity that in. So some of the organizations that I work with, like the American Museum, I'm part of trying to initiate more diversity in those spaces. So I was, I was part of a committee that created the um, Culture and Inclusion Cabinet and the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion within that organization to try and systemically change kind of the culture to be more integrated with different cultural That's how we're doing. Yeah, I thought about that. Yeah. So, do you experience it? Mostly, I'm with other ones. Um, I don't think so much on my part, but certainly people around me, you know, thinking, oh, that's fluff, that's not, you know, like we're quite quantitatively oriented. Do you know Blink Cummings was in your, was in your guy with the beard and the glasses? So he is our former uh, associate dean for research and the uh, 
my former director of our Center for my, their Research, initiatives, Research so which you need to check out. It's down right below us. There's eye tracking, there's psychophys, we've got continuous response lab. Um, yeah, very much. So you, know, you would have access if you ever wanted to use any of that. But um, anyway, um, my point is that a lot of our researchers here are quite quantitatively oriented. We have you know, a large percentage of um, uh, experimentalists compared to a lot of other communication programs. And so I'm one of a minority of more qualitatively oriented research and researchers. And so there's a, you're familiar with this. Think about um, diversity in the the Teada research level, different from one that for the working place, and if that's something that makes us feel, you know, like is, is it the same policy for everybody, the same way it you know like it shapes the relation with towards professors or with scientists or with other departments, is is that something you feel about it? Uh, because we, from the outside or whatever we have experienced, is like it seems like there is a, you know, a policy for all the institution, even a wider policy nationally or federally speaking, but it's not so obvious to identify in every working space or with other colleagues that, that kind of diversity, the cultural uh, patterns or or relations. Do you think that works here that way, or do you have any opinion on that? Español se puede o inglés, ya. Yeah. Okay, nosotros estábamos hablando un poco de la universidad que hemos encontrado aquí en Texas Tech. Y primero, yo le contaba a Timothy que la de mis de las que tomo son y en blanca. Entonces, en realidad, no encuentro muchas personas que se vean como yo, al menos en mis clases. He visto en los pasillos y por ahí otras personas, pero al menos en las clases, en el master's level, al menos, no he visto mucho. Entonces, mi sentir sobre eso es, la verdad, es un poco de orgullo al principio, como ser esa persona que representa mi comunidad en estos espacios. Y, pero al mismo tiempo, pues sí se siente la responsabilidad, que para mí es un poco injusto que yo tenga que que mostrar que nosotros podemos, ¿no? Yo no tengo que tener esa responsabilidad de demostrar que por ser negro o latino, pues tenga que ser una buena persona o tenga que ser mejor que todos, ¿no? Entonces, pues, pues eso es lo que siento. Me gusta, pues sí, que haya personas que se vean como yo en esos espacios, o sea, que yo sea esa persona, ¿no? Que esté representando. Mm -hmm. So, it's like... Almost, yeah. Yeah, I got, I got most of that. yeah, like it's the topic about representation, mm -hmm. like feeling like you or you have such a responsibility mm -hmm. as coming from a country different from mm -hmm. most of the people are in, in, in one space. And you're feeling that as a student, right? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what about for you working as faculty? How you see it from that position? Uh, would you see it in the same way? Like it, it's across everybody, it, it works in the same way, uh, these kind of issues? Or? No, in fact, we, we were commenting that our, our experience or our positionality is, is very, very different because um, Jen works in an environment and, you know, in, in a field that's dominated basically by men like me, middle-aged, cisgender, heterosexual white guys, right? But I, as that, 
operate in a space that's full of people of color and people in LGBTQIA community, et cetera, because I'm the director of this institute and um, am involved in a lot of uh, DEI initiatives uh, on campus. So I'm, you know, I don't want to say the token white middle-aged guy, but I'm one of, of, of only a handful on campus who I would say, you know, dedicate most of their, um, you know, research and service and most of our teaching to that. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we're, we're, we're both kind of in, in, in spheres that, you know, there, there's difference and that just struck me. And that's, that's what we need, I think. You know. Which is sort of another kind of responsibility magnified at, at your level. It's like you represent a group of, and sometimes it, that, that for me as an outsider, when I see people apologetically saying I'm white and I'm cisgender and I'm, mm -hmm. and it's becoming so common that we're like, yeah. usually people before saying even their names, they, they are already presenting these credentials and I'm like, is that something we need to build a dialogue, for instance, here? Is it a mass and how we do that uh, in this academic space? Or it's also another kind of, you know, sometimes it's symbolic. This speaking might be also hard for, for somebody just to accept. Yeah, judge me as so, but I'm not like you're thinking. Jen, you have anything? No, I think that's, that's a really good point. I mean, I think sometimes you, uh, I mean, I'm often I'm in a community where I'm the only woman in the room, so it's a different space where the um, I don't come in and announce <laughs> gendered white woman because it's like a, not the introduction that I need to make in those spaces per se, but often in other contexts that is how it, it feels like that I'm moving into a space where I want to say uh, I'm representing a, a dominant Kind of cultural norm and so i'm coming into a space acknowledging that kind of privilege and space and wanting to put that out there out front but yeah it's not something i've heard talked about or engaged with directly it's sort of just maybe i don't know where it starts you just start watching other people do it so you sort of pick up the habit of coming into a space and wearing your representation and saying it and um, maybe trying to excuse or be embarrassed or I don't know what the language is, but I've seen all different types of that, and occasionally feel that in front. You want to add something? Please. Um, so I, I have many thoughts. Um, I think one thing we, we talked about was that, um, and then as, as he said, uh, there are certainly different um, I think if you take an institution like Texas Tech, yes, there are initiatives, there are um, these groups, but if, if one doesn't actively seek them out, then it's very it's very easy to fall into, especially at a predominantly white institution like Texas Tech. Uh, do you know like uh, the history of HBCUs mm -hmm. in the United States? No. Mm -hmm. so, Texas Tech is what's known as a PWI, predominantly white institution. HBCUs are um, historically black colleges and universities. And they exist for the exact reason that um, oftentimes, especially um, black Americans can't get the same, they can't get the same level of comfort or the same level of education at an institution like Texas Tech. And so um, we have separate institutions that it's not that they don't permit white people or um, Latinos to go to these colleges, but it's more so to create these spaces where you can have an authentic university experience. So when you take an institution like Texas Tech, really, I, I never feel out of place, whether I'm in the College of Mathematics or here. And if I'm not actively seeking out opportunities like this, then I will easily fall into just my bubble of just being very comfortable as of um, just around people that only speak English and that um, are only from the United States and don't really have cultural backgrounds from other countries. And I really do wish that um, spaces like this or the Harris Institute were almost mandatory to some extent. It would create it would create more of a cultural flow um, between just all of the diversity of Texas Tech 
it's great that it's great that people from um, all their different cultures and backgrounds can find each other on on campus. Um, but I don't. It can be very easy to atomize those spaces, and um, it just I think it's very easy for the, that atomization to limit um, cross cultural communication and um, knowledge. That was very all over the place. No, it's great because it connects with the next activity, which is we believe like cases very common that we just mentioned, and that uh, probably these kind of further strategies to know how to not atomize, how to cope with that sort of these courses that are, you know, like very common in this in, in this in this university outside with our own academic community might be a great chance to talk about about that now. So Marcela, you wanna bueno vamos a tener tres casos cierto para poder analizar como vemos en el salón tenemos tres espacios. El primer caso tiene que ver con un personaje, una criatura que es científico. ¿Sí? Esta persona eh, va, digamos, su, su destino es un planeta donde las políticas públicas tienen un alto grado de inclusión y diversidad. Digamos que ese es el panorama al que se enfrenta esta criatura, pero tiene un problema. El problema es que no es sencillo identificar cómo se involucran aspectos relacionados a la diversidad en su diario trabajo. Si bien hay unas políticas públicas claras, eh, hay donde consultarlas, hay, digamos, todo un engranaje protocolario de, de, de esas, digamos, políticas como dije, de diversidad, cuando él llega a su lugar de trabajo, como que no es tan claro, como que necesita hacer un gran trabajo para identificar. Entonces, ¿cuál es el reto del primer caso? Ayuda a identificar eh, acciones para fomentar la diversidad e inclusión en su espacio de trabajo. Ya están las políticas públicas escritas. Ahora, bueno, ¿cómo trasladamos eso al contexto real, a la práctica, a la realidad? Entonces, digamos, ese es el primer reto que vamos a tener. El segundo es otro personaje, él es, o ella, es estudiante. Eh, él va a un planeta que es monolingüe, es decir, habla una sola lengua, nada más. Pero resulta que él tiene un problema, o ella. Es un estudiante de intercambio que desarrolla investigación sobre lenguas y dialectos de su planeta. Por tanto, está, digamos, todo el tiempo en comunicación con diferentes formas del lenguaje y, digamos, eh, uno con una, una, varias lenguas y además dialectos. Estamos hablando de comillas minorías, ¿cierto? Y luego, ¿cuál sería el reto? Entonces, ayudar a esta persona, a esta criatura, a encontrar estrategias para compartir sus resultados de investigación a una comunidad que no le interesa tanto las otras lenguas, los otros dialectos, digamos, todo eso que converge en la lengua, en una lengua distinta a su lugar de, de trabajo. Y el tercero, entonces, sería una persona que es investigador o investigadora, eh, él llega a un planeta multicultural, digamos que tiene toda una gama a, a, su, a su mando, por decirlo así. ¿Cuál es su problema? Cree que la multiculturalidad es muy importante para la vida social, pero no tanto para el trabajo científico. Está bien para ir a socializar, para salir, etcétera, conocer un poco ese planeta, pero para el contexto científico no tiene ninguna validez. ¿Cuál sería el reto entonces ahí? Ayudar a este personaje a identificar los beneficios del multiculturalismo aplicado a la investigación científica. Básicamente, ¿qué vamos a hacer? Les vamos a dar unos pusis, a los tienes unos posits para que ustedes pueden elegir un caso, o pueden elegir dos, o pueden elegir tres, pero vamos a escribir acciones puntuales para resolver o para ayudar a esos personajes que se encuentran en esa situación. Los dejamos ahí y la idea es que al final hagamos una especie de plenaria para ver qué nos llevamos puntualmente, digamos, de esas ideas que tenemos. Si de pronto es muy abstracto el ejercicio, nos podemos apoyar de nuestro rol en la universidad, o sea, estudiante, investigador, eh, profesor, líder de algún tipo de investigación grande o pequeña, etcétera. Podemos partir entonces de ahí. Ese es como el reto, si necesitan como apoyo de la instrucción, Rodolfo, marquen al 0 en 8 minutos. Case 1, case 2, and back there, case 3. Feel free, any. 1, 2, or 3. Specific action.
La idea es que al final nosotros podamos llevarnos esto. Si ustedes quieren, nos dejen sus correos electrónicos y nosotros les dejamos las memorias de esto que eh, logramos hoy entre todos. Como esas ideas y demás para que las tengamos, digamos, ordenaditas, por decirlo así. Digamos que estamos recogiendo un montón de conocimiento, experiencias, etc. Entonces, el que la que sea, nos deja su correo y, y les enviamos pues como lo que recogimos de esta actividad. En principio, ¿quién quisiera animarse a contarnos un poquito como qué identificó? Yo te estoy mirando a ti, pero... Sí. Sí. <risa> pero nada de expresión. Sí. Como, no, 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 no. Sí. A mí me gustó sí. mi respuesta sobre el primer personaje, en el cual quería mejorar la inclusividad y la diversidad dentro de su espacio de trabajo. Yo creo, mi respuesta fue que hubiera una rotación en las tareas dentro de este espacio de trabajo, de manera que todos tuvieran chance de hacer todo en algún momento. De esa manera desbaratábamos, deshacíamos esas jerarquías de trabajo en el que uno hace roles? Roles de trabajo. Entonces, que todos tengan un chance de hacer algo. Todo. ¿Cómo ven esa idea? ¿Les parece? Por ejemplo, como si en el instituto un día yo me sentara en la oficina de todo. Permiso. Yo ahí. Estoy enseñando un poco de algo. Claro, de pronto eh, tu idea es como en ese sentido de entender al otro esas funciones, del otro la carga cultural que quizás trae, como todos esos elementos que a veces no somos tan, no logramos como interactuar o comprender o, o resaltar, reconocer, visibilizar. Vale, listo, muchas gracias. Pronto, ¿alguna otra idea? Por ejemplo, el segundo caso. En el segundo caso tenemos dos papelitos. A ver, yo miro por colores. El amarillo no, ya, ya te baja tranquilo. Y por aquí tenemos como un verdecito, como... Sí. Um, I wrote that it might be a good idea to like develop really good work, but being as, um, using as little dependence as possible on natural language, so through demonstration and um, other ways of, of communicating other than the language, the nat what we would say a natural language that you know this being uses to, to communicate. And it actually reminds me of an initiative that was working with another professor. Unfortunately, he ended up leaving the university, but it was um, geared toward helping international instructors who were not Uh, native speakers of English to be able to communicate more effectively in the classroom by being less dependent on language, using more examples, using more illustrations and, mm -hmm. and, and that kind of thing. Because one of the complaints you often get with international instructors is, oh, their accent's too heavy, I don't understand them, whatever. And so the idea is there are other ways of, of being able to communicate, you know, even quite complex ideas that Um, doesn't turn into a 75 minute lecture in a language you don't speak well. I mean, I've been speaking Spanish a long time, but if I lecture for 75 minutes, people are going to be nodding off. Yeah. Como el ejemplo que vemos ahora en, en español, tiene género algunas palabras, por ejemplo. Mm -hmm. Entonces, digamos que habría que hacer como todo ese trabajo también de comprender, así estemos usando un solo lenguaje que la otra lengua concibe distinto, o quizás una instrucción o concibe distinto un, un entorno, un contexto, una situación. Entonces, creería que, que es importante también, así se habla una sola lengua, digamos que ese sea pues como el, el, el entorno, también tener algunas pistas, algunas luces, de que en la otra lengua, de las otras personas, quizás los significados son distintos. Creería que sería interesante también indagar un poco por ese lado. Bueno, en el caso 3... Vamos a ver si Jen se anima. <laughs> Jen, Jen. <laughs> Many ideas. Oh. Uh, only because I feel like this is, well, I'm case one, you know? Yeah? yeah. Eh, en cualquiera. Pues si quieres el three or number one of problems. Number three? Yeah. Ah, well, this one was harder for me to think of action. 
but because I believe there's such important relationships between those two, it was like I couldn't get outside my own belief that they're so interconnected to think of how I would show somebody what seems obvious to me. Um, so, um, but I think to use an example from my own research, often there's a notion that, re that scientific research is objective and that there should be no view from any point of view. It should just be this God's eye view. But in the literature that I work with, it demonstrates that those views are, it's not objective. There is no God's eye, it's always from somewhere. And the more, the more viewpoints we can have, that creates more objectivity, that, that creates a, a richer science because we have multiple points of view. But how you translate that into an action is harder for me. Like, to say, I, I suppose it would be through demonstration of a, a particular instance of research being less rich, but more enriched with different perspectives. But again, it's so, maybe I'm making it harder, but it was hard for me to come up with an action that would help. What about like in, in critique of, of work? I mean, would that be one way to approach it? Yeah. Like, like you've got, um, I don't know, results of an experiment or something pretty basic, but you you compare a pretty monolithic mm -hmm. group of let's say five people who are who are critiquing the work. Yeah. You know, pointing out strengths and weaknesses, and then you have another group of five quite diverse voices and see exactly. if there's any difference. Yeah. If yeah. there's not, then you might question the premise of yeah. I think that's good. I think there is something something about demonstrating it. I think um there's historical examples of marginalized or groups that have been left out of scientific research and instances of how we have, uh, as an example, how we have taken one body or one point of view as kind of the de facto body. So in medical research, the male body is the de facto body for all research. You know, research children's bodies and research women's bodies. All research was done on one body. And it's kind of a metaphor for not thinking about all the diversity of bodies that you need in order to have good medicine. And we saw multiple problems with assuming that the one male body, which was probably you know, a specific kind of male body um, as the center of medical research. So I don't know, there's examples like that, but it's harder. It's a good activity, you guys. It's yeah. Really hard. <laughs> yeah, it is. Sí, esa, esa incomodidad o esa dificultad, lo que queremos que tengamos. Porque hablarlo quizás es fácil, pero la realidad, llevarlo a la acción es difícil. Y, y empezar por la reflexión debería ser el camino. Empezar a identificarlo, reflexionar y bueno, ponerse en ese estado en cómo decir, ay, ¿cómo lo hago? ¿Cómo? Eso debería ser el principio para llegar a, pero no es fácil. Por eso necesitamos empezar con la reflexión y con espacios comunes donde converjamos eh, latinos, latinas, per diferentes personas con diferentes concepciones, historias, etcétera. De pronto, ¿quieres complementar algo? Por ejemplo, tome una persona de science, uh, eres de Cuba, y you care about environmental pollution, mm -hmm. yeah. yo soy de los Estados Unidos, I care about environmental pollution, um, entonces quizás tú tienes ideas diferentes que yo, pero tenemos the same problem, mm -hmm. entonces you, uh, you could have people from five different countries with backgrounds with the same problem. Um, and so they have different perspectives about it. And I think this is how you highlight, we have the same problem, we might have different experiences with it, um, but we're all looking for a common solution. How do we arrive at the common solution scientifically? Quizás uh, hay five different ideas um, and they all help together to build. But um, I think, yeah, I. I like to think of science as ways to solve real world problems. And I think a lot of the real world problems, we can find some common common ground similarities in that. Um, and we'll have different approaches to it, but that's all right. Yeah, and just the bigger issue of climate change yeah. and how, you know, if you can open a, a dialogue and discourse on how climate change is seen to affect, you know, not just the environment, you know, the natural environment, but cultures as well around the world then 
you know, I think it would pull people away from these more monocultural or monolinguistic mm -hmm. viewpoints. But unfortunately, you know, we're not having that dialogue. We're too distracted by by other things, or by deniers, climate change deniers, and and that. There is something that blows my mind, and I just experienced before coming, um, before the start of this workshop, there were three people discussing, and I think they were before us. And they were just, it's amazing how we express in Spanglish in a, a tech, but in serious way, really, they were building on theoretical issues by just switching one Spanish to English word. And I, I'm like, do they know what are they doing like mm -hmm. in, in the good scientific way like it's they are creating a language mm -hmm. and and i bet some people they don't understand how rich is only this mm -hmm. compared to other places in the world mm -hmm. or colombia cuba it's muy distinto this is a, a really a setting that you don't experience everywhere mm -hmm. and and I bet they were talking like that because they felt comfortable, just like we're doing, like we're switching from Spanish and English. But it's more common than you might think yeah. uh, when you walk around and you're like, wait, if you are building on any kind of discipline in Spanglish, yeah. that's well, not happening in Colombia. I, I bet in Cuba. You know. I think a lot of the discussion that I've heard about that has been, well, there's, you know, a lot of the theory, you know, a lot of the knowledge is developed in English. And so, you know, it's, it's hard to translate. But I actually find that in those kinds of conversations, sometimes there are concepts, sometimes there are terms that are available in Spanish, but don't really have the translation <laughs> in, in English. And so then you have to go to that if, you know, if both parties or, you know, multiple parties all understand what it means, it's a lot easier than trying to explain, well, this concept, you know, in the other, in the other language. And that's, that's the richness of, I was actually talking about that this morning in some research we did last summer on, um, bilingualism, translanguaging in the media here on the South Plains. It was very specific to Lubbock and the, the South Plains. All of the interviews were, were conducted here. And that's going on on a daily basis, but we often think about it as being allá, fuera de la universidad, fuera del campus. But it's not. It's, it's happening here, just maybe not as noticeably or as, as frequently because of the English dominance in, you know, in the American Academy. Yeah. Okay. Eh, les vamos a, a lanzar una responsabilidad y es esta pregunta. Queremos, eh, en vez de que se lleven certezas, que se lleven preguntas, que se lleven esa situación que vivimos hoy, de, de ay, cómo lo hago, ay, cómo se hace, eh, qué puedo proponer, cómo me pienso esto para que sea una realidad etcétera. Entonces, simbólicamente les voy a pasar a ustedes la responsabilidad. Espero que tengan entonces esa necesidad de plantearse este tipo de preguntas en el lugar donde ustedes tienen la oportunidad de compartir con, con otros compañeros y compañeras. Entonces, para cerrar el taller, la idea es que nos llevemos una pregunta abierta. Una pregunta que ustedes solamente van a tener la respuesta. Es como todo por el diálogo. Nosotros hacemos la pregunta abierta. Esa pregunta queda para ti, para tu quehacer diario, para, para validar oh, okay. en tu vida diaria cómo le doy respuesta yeah. y cómo lo llevo a la realidad o a la, a la acción, a las actividades puntuales, para que esta reflexión que tuvimos hoy no se quede en una anécdota o una experiencia, sino que se lleve al contexto real. Input from people who are in a different part of the hierarchy than me, sort of back to what you were saying about switching yeah. roles, and also thinking back to some of the experiences I had with Timothy when you were in my class. Remember when the students came from Guadalajara and stuff? I should have followed up with you and talked about well, what was that like as an intercultural experience, and you know how did that fit with sort of your your goals? But we didn't have that conversation. It would have been good to have it. So being, I guess, more open to other sources of, of, of input and then try to reflect that in my teaching and research. <laughs> yeah, so many. 
<laughs> Do you want to? So <laughs> <laughs> many uh, that I can think of, but to build off of that, one of the spaces in my department where there is more cultural diversity is with the graduate students. Um, and I'm just getting to know them. And I think for me personally, as new faculty, I'd like to follow that lead and say, what is it like for them to be here? And how can I take their lead? How can mm -hmm. I understand where they're coming from, bring their ideas into my teaching, into my space, because I'm very conscious of being too, for my taste, and probably objectively for anyone's taste, too uh, US centered in my research or you know culturally centered on Western ideas of disasters, for example, what I study. And so bringing in more cultural um, and diverse perspectives on that with those students and letting them have a voice that maybe they feel like they don't have in, in my department right now. <risa> bueno, mi pregunta viene un poco de una certeza que me llevo y es tal vez estar muy enfocado en, en pensar en cómo mostrar mi cultura dentro de este espacio multicultural. Y también abrirme un poco más a yo aprender de esta cultura que está a mi alrededor, que es diferente a la mía, que también siento que hay mucho que tengo yo que aprender. Bueno, más que tenga, pero que puedo aprender, ¿no? Entonces, pues sí, no, no preocuparme tanto y abrirme a la experiencia. Sí, que es para mí, yo, yo tengo que hacer más, uh, más de pues, cosas como así. Uh, por ejemplo, yo estaba pensando que I wasn't going to come here porque es más fácil para ir a la biblioteca y hacer matemáticas porque yo tengo un examen. Pues, eh, entonces, uh, reaching out a otros uh, y por ejemplo, with the research we did in the fall of 2019, uh, creo que yo, yo estaba, la, I was the only person <laughs> really from our class who talked with the students and I'm friends with some of them on Facebook now, but mm -hmm. COVID happened right after. Mm -hmm. he, oh, yeah. he, um, but you came to more of the events that we had organized that were voluntary, not required during the class time. Mm -hmm. Pero, uh, Yeah, he, uh, siempre, siempre buscando para oportunidades, cosas, uh, personas que normalmente I would not talk to. Um, no sé, no tengo, I don't have a great answer. Somebody that could say. <laughs> well, thank you. Muchas gracias. I think time. All right. Uh, All right. Maybe it's a next opportunity on our Proxima. We want to build on this, this, this very first one of. Deben proponer, ofrecer este tipo de taller a través de TLPDC, oh. searching Teaching and Learning Professional Development Center, y también la División Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, porque está muy, muy bien, queda muy bien dentro de sus metas, ¿no? Y sus responsibilidades, sus objetivos. And then we'll yeah. and, and we'd love to do the one of co-creation. It's something that we always experience. Amazing thing. Wherever we go, it's going to be way different. Muy, yeah. muy, muy bien hecho. Gracias. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly.